Yat Ten Vichet Vai Puman Vikshave Sarvam Ong Kurvan Nalang Kame Chatmane Parak, that which separates. Riktam, that which makes one free from attachment. Apurnam, that which is insufficient. Va, either. Aksharam, this syllable. Yat, that. Tat, which. Om. Onkara, iti, thus stated. Yat, which, kinchit, whatever. Ong, this word ong. Iti, thus, excuse me, thus stated. Yat, which, kinchit, whatever. Ong, this word ong. Iti, thus, Bhuyat, if you say, Tena, by such an utterance, Vichyeta, one becomes free, Vai, indeed, Puman, a person, Bhikshave, unto a beggar, Sarvam, everything, Onkuruvan, Giving charity, giving charity by uttering the word ong. Na, no. no. not, not. alum, alum. Sufficiently. sufficiently, kamena, kamena. for sense gratification, sense gratification. Cha. cha, also, also. Atmane. atmane, for self realization. Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada. This is Srimad Bhagavatam. Canto 8, chapter 19, text 41. The title of the chapter is The Lord Begs Charity from Balimaj. And this speaking here is Shukracharya, um, who's, well, the Lord is testing Balimaj, quite a big test. The Shukracharya is appearing like he's trying to um, change the decision of Bali Maharaj to give charity to Vamana by various arguments based upon material considerations. The utterance of the word Om signifi signifies separation from one's monetary assets. In other words, by uttering this word, one becomes free from attachment to money because his money is taken away from him. Jai Bada Parasishwara Ki Jai Jagam Paladeva Sabada Ki Jai Tai Sati Sutta Ki Jai To be without money is not very satisfactory. For in that position, one cannot fulfill one's desires. In other words, by using the word ong, one becomes poverty-stricken. Especially when one gives charity to a poor man or a beggar. One remains unfulfilled in self-realization and in sense gratification. And there is a purport where Srila Prabhupada says, writes, Maharaj Bali wanted to give everything to Vamanadev, who had appeared as a beggar. <coughs> but Shukracharya 
being Maharaj Bali's familiar spiritual master in the line of seminal succession, could not appreciate Maharaj Bali's promise. Shukracharya gave Vedic evidence that one should not give everything to a poor man. Rather, when a poor man comes for charity, one should untruthfully say, whatever I have, I have given you, I have no more. <laughs> hmm. Heard that one before. It is not that one should give everything to him. Actually, the word ong is meant for ong tat sat, the absolute truth. Onkara is meant for freedom from all attachment to money because money should be spent for the purpose of the supreme. The tendency of modern civilization is to give money in charity to the poor. Such charity has no spiritual value because we actually see that although there are so many hospitals and other foundations and institutions for the poor, according to the three modes of material nature, a class of poor men is always destined to continue. Even though there are so many charitable institutions, Poverty has not been driven away from human society. Therefore, it is recommended here, Bhikshave Sarvam Om Kuruvan Nalan Kamena Chatmane. One should not give everything to the beggars among the poor. The best solution is that of the Krishna consciousness movement. This movement is always kind to the poor, not only because it feeds them, but also because it gives them enlightenment by teaching them how to become Krishna conscious. We are therefore opening hundreds and thousands of centers for those who are poor, both in money and in knowledge, to enlighten them in Krishna consciousness and reform their character by teaching them how to avoid illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating and gambling which are the most sinful activities and which cause people to suffer life after life. Hmm. The best way to use money is to open such a center where all may come, live and reform their character. They may live very comfortably without denial of any of the body's necessities, but they live under spiritual control, and thus they live happily and save time for advancement in Krishna consciousness. If one has money, it should not be squandered away on nothing. It should be used to push forward the Krishna consciousness movement so that all of human society will become happy prosperous and hopeful of being promoted back home, back to Godhead. The Vedic mantra in this regard reads as follows. And there's no... Well, it's pretty much the same as today's verse anyway. A little bit different, but pretty much the same. Paragva etad victum aksharam yade tad omiti tad yad kinchit omiti aha tred vasami tad uchite sayat sarvam om kuryad richad atmanam sakame vyo nalam syat. Quite similar. No translation is given. I don't know if this. Sometimes there are editors in the Bhagavatam have put the translation in there, mm. but this one doesn't have a translation, so we cannot comment on that Vedic verse, but it's, it's quite akin in many ways to today's verse by the looks of it, at least in the meaning of the verse. Now, 
um, jog of memory. When Bali Maharaj made his promise to give three steps of land, uh, rather to Lord Ramadev asked for three steps of land. And Bali Maharaj willingly was willing to give those three steps of land, although he considered it a rather meager request, <laughs> since he was more or less, you could say, controlling, at least for the time being, he was like the ruler of the universe, practically speaking. And uh, three steps of land for a small dwarf, like personality, whom Bhamadev appeared to be, does not sound like a, an excessive piece of land, to say the least. The story unfolds, and we probably know that story. But, but um, when Bali Maharaj originally um, proposed to Vamana, please ask me, is the standard when you receive a a guest that one offers the guest who may not ask necessarily please ask for me whatever you wish I see you've come here you must want something please ask for me generally when a beggar comes up to one they usually want something <laughs> isn't it he did. <laughs> yeah, they you sometimes they if they don't ask, they take or they try to take. Um, but in this case, uh, it's Barimaj basically is the other way around. Is asking, please, how, what can you ask for me? Whatever you want. Ivan Dave doesn't necessarily even ask for anything, but he's asking, ask for me whatever you want. So this is, this is culture, this is a little different, and perhaps from our modern day experience. Um, sometimes that happens in terms of someone you recognize and accept, perhaps they're working on behalf of some organization which you have some, uh, let's say, affinity towards or some desire to assist. You may ask, please, what do you want? Let me know. I'll help you. For the material, as Prabhupada's mentioning here, people are often keen to give for the opening of hospitals or some other welfare institute, welfare activity. Um, in this case, there's, other than being apparently a, a well, he describes him like a little beggar, but he's a Brahmin. So in a Vedic culture, Brahmins were the most considered in many ways to be the exalted members of society. And people in general knew that giving welfare to a Brahmin is for one's own benefit from all angles. It's not just, let's <coughs> see, to help somebody, but it helps oneself by assisting, as Prabhupada mentions here, the Krishna consciousness movement in this purport, but Brahmins, serving Brahmins in general is necessary principle in human society for the pleasure of the Lord, but also for the benefit of society in general and the individual. By giving to a qualified Brahmana one gains how many times the result? I can't remember. Many times, thousand times or something. One benefits. Even an unqualified Brahmana, one gains at least something. Um, but here, of course, Brahmana is more than a qualified Brahmana. Um, but a Bali Maharaj was not necessarily conscious of that. Shukracharya was. And for various devious reasons, you could say, he uh, tried to 
divert the uh, intention of, um, of Bhagavad Maharaj away from giving charity. So these arguments which we just, you've just read, various arguments or various reasons why not to give charity, they're based on you know, statements which may be there in certain Karmakandi, I guess, sections of the Vedas, materialistic sections, which are generally geared to one's, one, one's own benefit. He has alluded or avoided the, 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 the point of giving to a Brahmin that you gain so much benefit. Because in one sense, he probably describes that Shukracharya is concerned about his own position, that he will be out of a job, he'll be on the dole queue or the social security trying to get some governmental help or something. It's a bit of a, not exactly, but that sometimes may be motivations um, for this. I remember one time, it's kind of a little related, I suppose. The, uh, I was one devotee in GBC, secretary for GBC, asked if we could help with any pujaris for a temple in Australia. So we sent one brahmachari, selfless brahmachari there, who was a Brahmin, to uh, help with the puja, but they wouldn't, the temple managers wouldn't let him do it. Because if he did it, then the Brahmins who were doing it presently, or trying to do it presently, would be out of a job. Because they're getting paid. Mm. So he never did the daily worship there. And shortly after he left, of course, because there wasn't sufficient service for him. So sometimes even in our Krishna consciousness, we don't see the higher benefits, the higher purposes. You can partially understand the reasoning of the devotees, you could say, um, who are dependent. Their ultimate goal is to depend on Krishna, not to, to depend upon material, uh, say, conditions or material considerations. They may have to be taken into account because of practical reasons. But here, Shukracharya is practically is wholly taking it into account. He's not even considering any value whatsoever in giving charity to this Brahmin boy. Well, of course, he, he's trying to also add the fact that this boy is a cheat. He's cheating you. He's not really a, what you think he is. We, we see this sometimes comes up for higher purposes. Even Jarasandha, they took advantage of, didn't they? He was very, very charitable to Brahmins. And, He'd gain, gain strength. Well, Vam Bali Maj was the same. He was very charitable to Brahmins, and that was one of the reasons that he was able to conquer over the heavens. Prime reason. He gained Brahmatejas, the strength of the Brahmins. They bestowed their blessings on him, whereas Indra had lost his, um, you could say, uh, blessings in many ways by uh, insulting his guru, Brahma, Brahmin guru. So, uh, yes, serving the Brahmins is a very important part of, even the demons often know this. In, ve in ancient times, many times they would know that uh, they were careful in this regard. Even though they had ill intent, they still recognized the importance of serving Brahma Seva, so serving the Brahmins, Brahma Seva. Whereas nowadays people have and that's one sense people are, they may relatively think they're somewhat rich, but no, not really. Maybe some karmas there. They've got a little bit of relative richness, but there's not much richness in society, even materially today. We're living in a not such a pleasant environment. Uh, we're exposed to all kinds of, you know, unwanted sufferings abnormalities in society of weather and health and so much mental distress, and stress, and their anxieties, and fears and what have you. And any moment, whatever relative wealth you have, uh, they have some 
times they have some economic recess, your assets become reduced sometimes to nil overnight. You thought you were a millionaire, and then you're nobody. Not a very, not really, because it's not real wealth. Real wealth is of a different kind, and gold and land, and animals and so on. Not in this artificial form of wealth which we have today. So aside from that, um, Prabhupada is emphasizing, now a jog of memory, when Bali Maharaj made or agreed, uh, proposed, take whatever you like um, at that point of time. Now, had he uttered Om? Had he uttered Om? No, not at that point. So he's, he may have made the promise, but unless the promise is accompanied by Om, don't get word about it. Right? You haven't done it. So you lose everything. Because he's looking at it from a very mundane point of view. A devotee, I mean, we have to lose everything in one sense what we perceive as something, we have to lose it. Even if we are a billionaire, we have to lose it. Eventually everything is taken away from us. We're very attached. So the whole idea, which again is not being proposed by Sukhachari, but the idea is that we become of which Prabhupada infers in the purport that we, we don't necessarily become, let's say, we don't reject the things of this world, even money. As some may do, my that is, some other so-called renunciates may totally renounce, so to, so to speak. But a devotee knows that I don't have anything to renounce because nothing's mine anyway. Everything belongs to Krishna. Renunciation is that, is to realize or to accept and to apply that nothing is mine. Renouncing something which one's attached to um, without proper understanding to whom it belongs is another form of attachment. The real renunciation is to give up the very concept, the false concept that anything is ours. The whole process, the whole principle, the whole purpose of human society, maybe not immediately in most cases, but eventually is to come to this point of understanding that everything is meant for the Krishna, for the pleasure of Krishna, and should be used in Krishna's service, and not in our own service, or for whatever reason rejected. It's Krishna's energy, not ours. It's Krishna. Lakshmi is the, you could say, represents the goddess of fortune. We're giving up the goddess of fortune, but we give up the idea that the goddess of fortune is meant for my pleasure. It was Ravana's fault. He thought that the goddess of fortune was, should be for his pleasure. And this is basically everyone's fault that everyone thinks that the goddess of fortune is meant for my pleasure. This is how we're imitating God. The goddess of fortune, all the wealth of the, that exists, everything that exists, in fact, is meant for the pleasure of the Lord. So the imitation of God, in practical terms, even without conscious awareness of his presence at all, as these demons, they may be conscious that there is some kind of personality, God, but they want to get rid of him. They want to kill him and take over, get the enemy out of the way. But most people are not even conscious of that, but they're behaving in that mood. They think that things are meant for their sense enjoyment. This is the same principle, because every form of opulence, be it money or property or whatever it is, is the... Um, um, <coughs> Excuse me. It is a, you could say, a manifestation, 
perceivable manifestation of the goddess of fortune. And the goddess of fortune is not meant for us to enjoy. She is meant for the pleasure of Lord Vishnu, Krishna. So this mentality, whatever we are, whether we're in a dog's body or a hog's body or a human body, pervades. This is meant for my enjoyment. That stool is meant for my enjoyment. Of course, not that we offer a stool to Krishna. But everything is a transfer, perverted transformation of the Lord's energies. But everything is meant for Krishna's pleasure. Ultimately, we have to see how that can be done. That's the proper um, renunciation. Not giving up things, as Rupa Goswami says, that can be used in Krishna's service. But rather, we learn to offer them to Krishna. This is somewhat preliminary on the path of pure devotion, but it's a, a necessary understanding. Otherwise, we can't advance. If we're, still adva- if we're still attached to thinking that something, somewhere, is meant for my pleasure, separate from Krishna, we, we're still, you know, we've still got our foot in the material world. When Prabhupada says you can live comfortably in some, you can see that in different ways. One is in the beginning stages, neophyte stages. Obviously, there's going to be an element of mixture. Um, and from the spiritual point of view, Krishna looks after his devotees anyway, even if you don't ask for it. Naturally, he's going to look after his devotees. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to lose because nothing is ours. So just use whatever appears within your, um, let's say, in your ability to to uh, work with. Just do, use it for use it for me. I will free you. Surrender everything to me. I will free you from all fear. It's uh, it's amazing how this concept of ownership is so powerful. This attraction to money or wealth in different forms is so, such a powerful um, illusion. This really is the, the manifestation of our envy of Krishna, though we're not consciously aware of that. People are always trying to accumulate more. They're willing to take all risks to get money. They risk their lives sometimes, isn't it, to get wealth? They risk their lives. Like that. Well, they're all risking their life. Everyone's risking their life in one sense. But they literally do that to get wealth. They, they, they take that they gamble. I think it's gambling to get money. And many times it ends up in disastrous, most times disastrous results. If not in this lifetime, long term for sure. But it's a big risk people are taking. It's is there an illusion, complete illusion, about our self-identity and about the purpose of life and, and everything else, the ownership and so on? We're an illusion, total illusion. And we may still have an element of that illusion which manifests maybe not absolutely clearly in the form of w- w- accumulating wealth as a sign of success, but in another sense, of putting oneself in a center. Bali Maharaj had a little, little tiny tinge of this as well, still had it actually, um, of wanting to be respected, of seeing ourselves in the center, enjoying another form of Krishna's energy, praise from other living entities, recognition, position, worship, and so on. There's another illusion, which is a little more subtle, you could say, than the gross one. The gross one's a little more definable and easy to ascertain or easy, maybe even easier to apply, you know, maybe. But that internal one is root, more brutal. It's more difficult to, to give up or to surrender. Surrender that to Krishna. Surrendering that to Krishna means since money is meant to be used in Krishna's service. Praise is meant to be used in Krishna's service. Worship is meant to be used in Krishna's service. Recognition, recognizing everything in relationship with Krishna, not that we are ourselves the enjoyer of those words of praise or worship or whatever form it may take. 
but everything is meant for Krishna. That's the transparent media. The Shukrashara certainly wasn't manifesting that mentality. But a pure devotee does. He doesn't take any praise for himself. He doesn't take any worship for himself. He take anything for himself. Everything. He's just a transparent media. Transparent media. Pali Maharaj will learn that lesson. He hasn't quite learned it yet. But he's um, definitely teaching a great example here, um, which will come up in the following verses. We won't go there. Of, of a, a very big dilemma. We're often faced with dilemmas in life. In fact, life itself, in illusion, illusory life, conditioned life is a dilemma in of itself. We all have um, personality crisis, huh? identity crisis. Everybody, no matter who we are, who I Kashi Pu down. Everyone has identity crisis. This is the underlying problem in the world, in the material world. This false identity of thinking we're separate from Krishna and seeing everything else around us as separate from Krishna. This is our illusion. The chanting of this sound vibration, Om Hare Krishna, same principle, can help release us from this, basically the, the root of the problem, this false identity, this illusion of identity, can help free us from that. That's why Sri Prabhupada has established establishing centers all over the world to try to awaken, enlighten people in their real identity and the real purpose of human life particularly and the real proprietor of everything to establish its Ishavasyam society, Om Purnamadam, Purnamidam. Well, Srila Prabhupada, in perhaps one of the first books he published was Ishopanishad. That's a very significant book. And one of the first books we ever were distributing was Ishopanishad. And it was, you know, it was a prominent book. I mean, we don't hear much about it now. Every day we had class on Ishopanishad. It was quite in, important to grasp this subject matter very care carefully and apply it in our lives because it, it does contain the underlying solutions to all problems and uh, awakening us to our real identity. We used to sing it on the street, on Harinam. Ishavasyam idam sarvam. Go on the Oxford Street singing Ishavasyam. Kirtan, Kirtan. Accompanied by Kirtan, you're following uh, Yamuna's record, eh? And sing it. And we sing Samsara Dava on the street as well. Samsara Dava, Nalalita Loka. We sing different things some, sometimes, primarily Hare Krishna. <laughs> it's not an excuse for not attending Mangalati. Um, yes, to awaken. We've got a charity begins at home, as they say. Giving charity. If we ourselves are not in this consciousness, then whatever charity we give is not going to be so beneficial either. We may be giving grudgingly or with pride or with intention of getting something in return or freedom from our sufferings, or something like that. Some mundane purpose behind it. We want to be recognized as a charitable person, as a selfless person, as a good person, a good devotee. Um, that may still be there. And that pure chanting of the holy name of the Lord, utterance of this sound vibration, it's with quality, it's a degree of quality, removal of these 
force, understanding of this force, ego, cleansing of the false ego, the quality of our chanting, the quality of our prayer, the quality of our intentions, etc. Attitude, Prabhupada says, is what really matters in this case. Well, Bali Maharaj's attitude is pretty good. I mean, he's willing, he's willing to give up the normal process of the demonic, the dem demons. And, you know, you try to utilize everything for one's own apparent benefit, but he's willing to sacrifice that. It's a material consideration also to fulfill his promise. To fulfill his promise. He was afraid of breaking his promise and becoming a liar. As you may know, in the Bhagavatam, maybe a third canto, I can't remember it, he describes how there's one thing that Mother Earth cannot tolerate, and that is a liar. One who says one says something, but doesn't really mean it. Mm. Hypocrisy, duplicity. This uh, Mother Earth, what form it takes, but she cannot tolerate it. Many things she tolerates. It's not mentioned here, Prabhupada said, trying to educate people in this human life how to give up meat eating, illicit sex, gambling and intoxication. We become a little bit uh, cultured, a little bit more, I'd say, self-controlled, a little bit more quality. But uh, lying or duplicity is, in, in other words, trying to manipulate, to fulfill one's own um, Intent, self-intent, is a very considered a very. This is practically speaking, the most bond binding, almost um, duplicitous situation, which will keep the living in. Honesty is a rarity, coming down to zero in Kali Yuga, more and more truthfulness, honesty, even on a mundane level. Not to speak of the spiritual one. This is a um, challenge, to be able to be honest, straightforward, which is highly required if we want to attain the real, real valuable thing as, as Dhruva Maharaj, who with mixed intent had approached the Lord, um, material intent. But eventually he realized that all material achievements are like broken pieces of glass. Freedom from that desire for trying to enjoy that which belongs to Krishna when we're free of that. This body, this mind, this world, this temple, everything is meant for Krishna's pleasure. Our husband, our wife, our children, everything is meant for Krishna's pleasure. We become free from those attachments. Well, you know, give some, but I, can't I just have something for my pleasure? You know, one, one percent, two percent, three percent, maybe the other way around. Can't I just have five percent for me? Four percent? Prabhupada was very merciful, very lenient, you could say, but that's not our goal. We don't want to bargain with Krishna or hold anything back. Surrender means don't hold anything back. When Sanatana Goswami was traveling with Isha and his servant, Sanat and Goswami had left everything behind, eh? you could say, well. But to Ishan had some or another managed to acquire a little bit of that wealth, and he had, what was it, nine gold coins or something? Eight, eight gold eight coins? <laughs> I thought he had eight or nine? He what? had eight, but, but he, he only gave seven. Okay, it was eight and seven. <laughs> seven, eight, nine. <laughs> nine doesn't like seven. <laughs> Just seven, eight, nine. Funny joke. So he had eight gold coins and he gave the astrologer seven. The astrologer knew he had eight, and, uh, but he kept one. You see how our attachment is there? Insecurity, fear, insecurity is so strong. We don't depend on Krishna. A little bit. But 
I still have to keep my insurance in this world. Because right? mm. we may have to for practical reasons, that's okay. But we don't really depend on it. We depend on Krishna. We may have money, we don't depend on money, we depend on Krishna. We may have family, we don't depend on family, we depend on Krishna. We have to do our duty in relationship to Krishna's properties, Krishna's servants. But ultimately we're here to, in all your activities, be conscious of me, aren't you? And depend always on me. Do your duty, but depend on me at the same time. To come to this level, the stage which we are trying to cultivate, is not necessarily the stage of love, Real, I mean, the fruit of that is love. There's not much love at this point of time, but it's a step towards love of offering everything to Krishna. Mm -hmm. Bhagavad Gita, yat karoshi dashnasya jahosi dasya. So Bali Maharaj is by good fortune is in a position now where he's got this opportunity to offer whatever he thinks is his to Krishna. And he's not He's a devotee, so he's not going to miss this opportunity, even though his spiritual master is doing everything he can to stop him doing it. We have this experience many times in our lives with friends, family members, sometimes even devotees, try to stop us surrendering. Mm -hmm. oh, don't join the Brahmachari Ashram. <laughs> Don't go on Sankatan, they don't know various excuses. No. Don't preach. Various ways, preaching in another way, but not in a normal way. You hear all sorts of things. Don't surrender. Don't trust them. Many temptations or let's say challenges are there on the path. And we have our own internal ones, the doubts which are in our own hearts due to our past conditioning and so on and so forth are never ending some, you may say. Various doubts about various aspects of what we term devotional service may be there and they may challenge our progress in spiritual life. To give that up, surrendering everything, surrender unto me, we want to become freed of fear. I do not have so many doubts. And he became fearful. Fears, doubts, almost synonymous. So to become free of fear, not just free of things by force or choice, but free of fear. That's not possible unless we take shelter of Krishna. It doesn't come only just by giving things up comes by taking shelter of Krishna, which is the essential purpose of even this particular section of Bhagavatam. To come to hit completely depend on, do what you like with me. This is Srila Prabhupada, I'm following, of course, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission, is establishing this opportunity to become fearless, to become selfless in the material sense of the term, freed of any false identity, but identifying oneself as Krishna's servant. Like that. So the chanting of the holy name is, is the method, is the process, the only process, the only process of this transformation. The statement of Lord Chaitanya is not our statement. It's the only process for this transformation of seeing ourselves in the center, but seeing Krishna in the center. But the quality of chanting has to be there. That has to be cultivated. In the association of devotees, and by trying to follow the process, which is given in this regard. Hare Krishna. So before every activity, we should chant Hare Krishna. And during the activity, mm -hmm. we should chant. And at the end of the activity, we should chant. And if we're not even doing an activity, we should chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Kirtaniya Sadahari. That would be nice. But of course, we, we'll be inspired to do things, to help others, to 
take up the chanting of Hare Krishna and to gauge our senses. We may not be on the transcendental platform to engage our mind and senses. We do have to also engage them in various activities. We can't, we're not, it's not really feasible at this point of time to expect we can simply sit 24 hours a day chanting Hare. And now we just started Chattamasya a couple of days ago. I'm sure you're all undergoing tremendous austerities during this period of time to enhance your pure devotional practices. Um, most of us probably not even doing anything different to normal. Don't go to the extreme, you know, don't shave, eat off the floor, just kittery once a day, lick it up mm-hmm. off the floor. These type of things are not recommended in our particular situation. One time Srila Prabhupada was asked, I think it was Gurudas, somebody asked him, Kartik, we're not in Kartik, but anyway, it's a similar thing. What vrata should we perform in Kartik, Srila Prabhupada? Is there any urge of vrata? What, what vrata should we perform? What should we be doing? Prabhupada said, you should be chanting 24 hours a day, Hare Krishna. No eating, no sleeping. <laughs> And immediately the voice started chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Prabhupada said, that's another madness. You can't do it. <laughs> we try to imitate and pick up rules and ideas that are not really favorable to us at this point of time. We have to see what is favorable. Detail, you could say, but print generals are there. We chant as much as we can, at least. Try to remind ourselves and remind others to chant Hare Krishna as much as we can, even if everything else is completely going haywire, going crazy. Keep chanting Hare Krishna in all conditions. And the what's happening around us. And hopefully eventually we'll come to our senses and wake up from our dream or our illusion and realize what this movement's for and what we're meant to do in this human form of life, what its purpose is. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare. And we also have the marathon, I believe, is starting. Is that right, Diana Tai? Prabhu? When? Is it? <laughs> I was always trying to derive a meaning out of this word mara. Mara means death. <laughs> is that which causes death, or that which frees us from death, or that which, mm-hmm. what is it? Mm-hmm. it? For some it causes death, huh? mm-hmm. and for others it frees us from death. If we, <laughs> if we undertake it for Krishna's pleasure, then it will free you from death. So um, when's, it's, uh, when's the... Marathon within the marathon start. You mean book distribution? Yeah. Book distribution. Little marathon to bless all of the Olympic p- participants. Mm-hmm. The devotees in Paris are going on a marathon, although they may not be in Paris, nonetheless, that we have to thank the Olympic Committee and those who are participating for inspiring this marathon. (laughs) Right? Even though they don't realize it and they're not helping us that much beyond and above that. In fact, they're probably quite the opposite. But still, the body is never deterred. We find a way around it some or another to get the real purpose behind it is not just to distribute books to the spectators or whatever, but just to distribute books to conditioned souls for the pleasure of Krishna, no matter who they are. So, um, yes, so that begins, well, it begins on Friday, doesn't it, the Olympics, right? Friday they start, isn't it? And it goes on for two or three weeks, maybe three or four if you count the, what do they call it, the Paralympics? A, short, a smaller one afterwards for conditioned souls who have you know, various challenges, physical challenges, whatever you call it. Um, so that's one opportunity to try to participate in increasing 
the book distribution. The devotees in London have just had a marathon pre... Where's Gange? Is he here? You're not, you're from Cardiff. But in London, they've been having a pre um, Rathayatra marathon. Huh? And I think it was two or three weeks long, but they said they did more books during that time than they did in the Christmas marathon. I don't know the figures, but that's what they told me. Um, so let's see what Krishna's plans are. You better order big. Yeah. Don't order eight boxes of Gita. You've got to order 80 boxes at least. Maybe, uh, maybe 800 boxes. Do we have 800 boxes? Almost. Not quite. We've got about 400 boxes at New Marple. So don't be under. But anyway, use your common sense. And do what we can. The marathon. And if we also, you've already mentioned, of course, our dear God brother Vishwambar Prabhu passed away a few days ago. He was like the the rock of the French Yatra during the 70s and 80s. Behind the scenes, he was the, well, we don't call it regional secretary now, they call it national secretary, but he was like the national secretary for France. And uh, a very, very wonderful devotee. Full of, and whatever association I had with him was extremely inspiring. Wonderful devotee. That will be talked about by other devotees, I think. You're having a memorial ceremony soon? Yeah. We will organize it uh, discussion tomorrow with Dalasindhi Prabhu to see how we can organize it. And yeah, we'll talk to the those who knew him quite well. I mean, he knew him, of course, as well. But Gopaswami and Sikshastakam and others to see what they're doing at New Mayapur or wherever it is. Mm -hmm to do something nice because in many ways of all the devotees who served here in France during that period, um, they were all great and glorious, but I mean, he, in many ways, he was the most prominent. In many ways, he didn't make it known. It wasn't known, perhaps. Others became more known. But we have Indra Dunamaj, and Bibi Gopindamaj, and many great souls were here. Of course, Bhagavan was the GBC, and initiating guru at that time here. But, but uh, Vishwambar was the one behind it, getting things done, facilitating what's going on, and uh, holding the fort, so to speak. Yes, Hare Krishna. Is it time for Mongol Arti? <laughs> Somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> uh -huh. Somewhere, on, somewhere during the 24 hours. <laughs> I, I get up when Gangaya, I go to, re, I took, re, I took, took rest as Gangaya is getting up. Huh? Mm -hmm. What time do you get up this morning? I couldn't sleep last night, so I woke up at 4. I thought so, I didn't hear you. Mm -hmm. I, I still I was waiting for the, for the sounds and nothing was coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had, didn't have a good night. I disturbed him. I disturbed him in his room last night. He was trying to take rest. I uh, bet it was. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see something scary, just as you're about <laughs> to take rest, you know, <laughs> difficult to sleep. You know, innocent brahmacharis. Mm -hmm. Anything? Yes. Do you have a problem? Uh, I have a question regarding this pastor. Then this remaining coin, gold coin, um, Sanatana Goswami told him to take it and go home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I felt it was like a bit of a punishment because he had this attachment yeah. to his yeah. older association. Yeah. Is it the case? Or kind of, yeah. Showing, well, there's different examples of being shown there, you could say. But uh, this is a, it's so. Sort of, we don't necessarily go into it in terms of the numbers or the detail of what it was. But, uh, you know, we have to give up all these. Anything that might be a death now, anything that might keep us bound up in this material world. Prabhupada also sometimes 
would indicate that certain, in certain situations, better you go home. You're not ready. Go home to mummy if you don't want to. He said that about cleanliness one time. He said, if you, don't want, if you want to keep clean, then go home to your mum. Whether it's cleanliness or attachment to material things or trying to impose one's materialism in the Krishna conscious movement, etc. And it's not so black and white as that, but this is a, a pretty black and white principle. I will just would say these things, but it wouldn't be necessarily enacted. But as long as we've still got this attachment, then we have to, what we call home, is that we're going to be punished. And listen, just sing the song. What is it? Is it Lochan Das? I call it Paramakuna. Because I still have material attachments, I'm being punished by Yamaraj. I think it's Lochan Das. So this is, uh, you know, an example for us. Anything short of the mark means that we're still going to have to go home to mummy, so to speak, and be born again in this world. And that's not our goal. Maybe, hap- maybe it'll happen, but that's not our goal. Maybe we've got to go through a few more lessons yet. But that's not a we try to learn from these lessons. That's one angle of that pastime. <coughs> Because Isham was a great personality in another sense, servant of Sanatana Goswami. When Lord Chaitanya had a similar experience with Krishna Das, his servant, right? when he was traveling in South India, his servant became enamored by the Bataharis, the gypsy girls, and fell down basically. He was the servant of Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya punished him, he rejected him. <laughs> He turned to poor he told him, no, no way. But he didn't totally reject him. He, he, it's not that's like the end of it, finish. You don't rot in hell forever. Mm-hmm. Not that type of mentality. But you have to learn another lesson. Now, the punishment itself is the purification, depending on how you get it. It's just like that, that brahmachari who was thinking, I, can, I am very qualified because I follow Chattamasya. And because I only drink milk once a day, I'm the most qualified. Maybe he was thinking like that. And he managed by the arrangement of Srivast Thakur to be present while Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was performing his nocturnal kirtans in the house of Srivast Thakur. He hid him in the room so he could see it. So when Lord Chaitanya saw that this person still has this false ego, Someone has false ego here. Who is it, Srivas? <laughs> no, no, only pure souls are here, my lord. Mm-hmm. Srivas, tell the truth. <laughs> who is here? Somebody is here who shouldn't be here. <laughs> well, my lord, no, no, there's, there's a brahmachari, but he's very pure, my lord. He only drinks milk. <laughs> you think you can attain me by drinking milk? <laughs> Get out! Get out of here immediately. Get him kicked out. But it sounds like a pretty heavy punishment. He even had his mother, Srivas Thakur's um, mother-in-law, kicked out. It, it sounds pretty strict, but it sounds pretty heavy punishment. But that's just a blessing. The punishment of the pure devotee, the chastisement of the Lord, um, whatever you want, is a real blessing. But it's a blessing to the degree that we accept it as such. So that Brahmachari, he was thinking, I'm getting my good reward, good due reward here for being punished by Lord Chaitanya. I deserve it. I'm so fortunate. I can't imagine how fortunate I am for a few moments I saw him dance. How fortunate am I? I don't know. He was, he was really thinking himself, you know, very fortunate <coughs> and getting a minimal punishment. <coughs> So in that way, Lord Chaitanya saw his attitude and called him straight back in again. Now you're qualified. Come back. So it all depends on the attitude, not necessarily. We all make mistakes. But it depends on the attitude which we, we have upon you know, receiving whatever punishment appears to be coming our way. If we fight against it, if we try to go on a whole campaign to destroy you know, the, the, the opponent, the person who's Punish me. This is 
then we were not making any progress at all. Given a chance, but missing the opportunity. But, uh, that's often the case that we do like that. You know? We want revenge. Wanting revenge is like one of the most materialistic obstacles in our progress in spiritual life. It's devoid of bhakti. It can often happen. <coughs> Even a test is a test on our, on our progress. We may have to go a little longer to learn that test. That's one test. The boy holds no grudge against anyone. Look at Harry Das Thakur, my goodness. Mm. Harry was punished, beaten in marketplaces, and so on and so forth. Mm. He didn't even want to, when he was asked, basically speaking, when after the whole past time, how is this, you know, how did this happen? How did it happen? Harry Das said to her, Actually, he was t t talking for the people internally in his heart. There was no real punishment at all. It was a, see, it was a blessing. Jainanda saw it as a blessing when he was tortured, basically, by hell. So he's a blessing, a blessing. I should have been punished unlimitedly more. I heard blasphemy of the Lord in the court of the Nawab. I should have been punished unlimitedly more than I got. I got away real lightly. He just saying that for the sake of others, I mean, but um, he sees it like that. The body accepts Tainu Kampam Sushi Mikshamam Bhujanevatna Kutabi Pakam. He sees whatever punishment, apparent punishment, suffering, apparent suffering that comes that way, because it's all based on material concept or perception. Um, is nothing. I deserve to suffer so much more. But the devotee doesn't ask for freedom from that. He just takes shelter as Krishna, whatever you want to do, my Lord. It's all, everything's under your control, not mine. Whatever you know, you know what's best for me. The devotee sees that the goings on are, in, of course, from the managerial point of view, action sometimes has to be taken, but for the sake of everyone to uphold dharma and so on. But internally, the real dharma is taking shelter of Krishna, giving up all other temporary shelters, all other, even dharmic ones, sarva dharma in particular, give them all up, surrender to me. So internally, the devotee surrenders to whatever you want to do with my Lord. If you want to punish me, so be it, externally. And then the devotee is freed. Depends what we want. We want material freedom or spiritual freedom. Okay. Maybe some mixture is there. We want to come to the pure stage. Chant Hare Krishna. As Prabhupada said, like a child who has no other dependents other than parents. Chanting, crying like anything. No one can satisfy the child but the mother. So I like that when we realize that no one can really protect us other than Krishna, nobody, nobody. There's nothing else that can satisfy us other than Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Gaur Premanandi. If punishment is required, so be it. We're all being punished. We may not understand it, but we are. It's all relative. But sometimes it becomes a little more relative than usual. But that's a great blessing when we understand it in relationship with Krishna. Shri Prabhupada ki jai gantrai shrima bhagavatam ki jai gaur premanandi haribo Hare Krishna. Chatramasya. <laughs>